Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us and welcome to the first session of our new teacher webinar series. My name is Ben Wheeler Floyd and I am a customer service associate at Michigan Language Assessment. I'll be moderating today's event. Our presenters for today are Dr. Rita Simpson Vlock and Sally Thielen. Rita is the educational materials developer at Michigan Language Assessment. Sally is an assessment specialist who works on the team that creates our exams. Together, Rita and Sally have extensive experience teaching ESL and EFL. They have taught students ranging from young learners to higher education in six different countries. The title for today's webinar is Six Strategies for Developing Listening Skills for the MET. And now I'm pleased to turn it over to Rita and Sally. Hi, I'm Rita. And I'm Sally. Thank you so much for joining us today. Yep. We appreciate your being here with us for our first in this, what we hope to be a series, an ongoing series of webinars, support teachers. Uh, so this webinar is one of the educational resources we offer to support teachers preparing to take the MET. We also have um, a sample test available for download on our website. Uh, as well as newly published official practice test books um, available from the U of M Press. And the purpose of this webinar is to help teachers develop students' listening skills in order to better prepare them for the lis listening section of the MET. The format of the session is a 45-minute presentation followed by time for questions and answers. First, Sally's going to briefly describe the MET and outline the listening section of the MET and the skills that are tested. Then we will present and discuss six strategies for practicing these skills in the classroom with examples and activities for each strategy. We'll close, as I said, with time for answering questions from you through the, um, through the chat feature, I guess, the listening, the Q&A feature yes. of Blue Jeans. So the examples we are going to refer to in this presentation come from the new um, practice test books, but I wanted to make sure I mentioned that this session is not really intended to be a description of the listening test or the listening items per se. It's also not meant exclusively as a test prep a set of test prep strategies, but it's an overview of some classroom teaching strategies that you can use more generally with your students in addition to helping with test preparation ideas. So by the end of this webinar, you will have a framework for a variety of strategies and activities that go along with those strategies to practice listening skills in your classrooms, uh, as well as an understanding of how those activities and tasks can be adapted for different learners and how they relate to the skills that are tested on the MET. Also, at the end of this webinar, or after this webinar, um, probably on Monday, be sure to check your email because uh, every registered participant will be receiving a certificate of attendance, as well as a copy of the PowerPoint slides um, and a handout with all of the content in addition to um, some added resources that you can refer to. So do we have results from the poll? Yeah, let's check out the poll. Okay, so our first poll was, in what region of the world are you located? And it looks like 88% is from right. Central, Central and South, and America. South America. Okay. And I personally just want to give a shout out to everybody at FISC in Brazil, because fun fact about me is I actually taught at a FISC in Manaus in Amazonas. So, ben bindo. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'm going to talk about our MET test. So the MET is a multi-level secure exam for ages 16 to adults. It's for high beginner to advanced students. So that's on the CEFR level of A2 to C1. It can be either a four skills or a two skills exam. Both of those exams include both the listening and reading section, um, whereas the four skills exam would also include a speaking and writing section. The topics are social, workplace, and educational, with an emphasis on educational topics. The MET listening test, which is what we're gonna be talking about today, um, consists of 50 items in three parts. It takes 35 minutes. The first part 
um, consists of short two-person conversations with one question, and pretty shortly we'll be listening to one of those. Mm -hmm. And then in part two, it's longer two-person conversations with three to four questions. And then in part three, there's a monologue, which is usually a lecture or a radio talk or announcement, and that is followed by four to five questions. The MET listening skills consist of three different skills. So we have global, um, which tests a learner's understanding of a conversation or talk as a whole. Um, so Rita, if you're going to share with us a global skills question from the MET, uh, what might that sound like? So an example from the practice uh, test, one of the practice tests in the book is, what does the woman want to do? That would be a main idea, global skills. Great. Okay, and then the next skill is local, um, and that tests the learner's understanding of specific supporting details or vocabulary. Uh, so Rita, from the MET, what might a specific question, a local question, oh. sound like? Um, so this question says, what is not included in the monthly rent? Okay. So it's a high level of detail. Yeah, and remember that for later, because we're right. going to be listening to that talk. Okay, and then finally we have inferential skills, and that really tests the learner's ability to go beyond what they what is explicitly stated. So they're drawing conclusions, they're making predictions, or it's asking them to understand a rhetorical function. So what might an inferential question sound like, Rita? So one of the questions um, here says, after the talk, this would be after a, a monologue, mm -hmm. but it could be after a dialogue as well. Mm -hmm. After the talk was finished, what did the speaker expect the audience to do? Okay, great. So that sounds like you have to make a prediction. prediction. Great. Okay, so Rita is going to talk about the strategies we'll talk about today. Thanks, Ali. So uh, each of the strategies we present here has multiple possible activities or task types and variations. In this webinar, we're only going to highlight one or two activity types for each strategy, but on the handout that you'll be getting, um, there are additional suggested activities for each strategy. So it's really um, kind of a framework for thinking about how to practice listening, and, and there's just a, a lot of um, room within that framework for variation and creativity. As far as difficulty level of the activities, all the strategies are potentially adaptable to all levels of learners targeted by the MET A2 to C1. Uh, but where uh, the first three strategies we'll talk about are ones we chose because they seem more easily adaptable to lower level learners. And the last three strategies would include activities that we think are more adaptable to the higher level or advanced learners. And all the strategies attempt to create authentic context for practicing listening. So listening, of course, is a receptive skill, and it's an internal process. So our challenge as teachers is figuring out how much students understand of what they're listening to. But it's not possible to effectively practice and develop listening skills in isolation. And we can't just practice by continually quizzing our students. So all of the strategies we present here integrate speaking reading, writing, along with listening. All right, moving on now to the strategies. And you'll see the icons um, there that you saw on the previous slide. Um, those are meant to sort of um, remind us or remind you of which skills are primarily included in that particular activity. So obviously all of them will include listening. So the first strategy uh, is the one we're calling listen and answer questions, pretty basic. It's the one most similar to the tasks found on the MET. Namely, students listen to a passage, either a conversation or a monologue, and they answer questions about the passage. It's important to practice this strategy regularly since these are the task types included on the test, but not to the exclusion of the other strategies that you'll hear about. The next slide breaks down the various possible types of questions to use. So as a teaching and learning strategy, you have a lot more latitude than when you're just practicing for a test or, do, or taking a test or doing a practice test. 
So for example, you can include yes, no questions, true, false, either or choice questions. Um, and note for WH questions, they can be open-ended or multiple choice. So for practice activities in class, open-ended WH questions might be a little more challenging. Um, and in some cases, that's, that's better. Um, true, false, and yes, no questions are very similar. Syntactically, they're just syntactic variations of the same kind of question. Uh, but it's important, we think, to use yes, no questions in addition to true, false because it's, it, it's more like what happens in natural conversation. Um, we, we don't generally go around talking about, well, true or false. You you're, ate breakfast. You're hungry now. <laughs> right. Um, so for the content focus, you can ask questions about factual details or main ideas, factual questions, um, prediction or inference questions, functions about uh, rhetorical function, questions about rhetorical function or speaker's intention, um, why they said certain things, or questions about causes, effects, and reasons. And uh, it's important to think not only of yourself as the teacher as the one asking the questions, but make sure you allow time and opportunities for students to generate the questions. Um, especially more advanced students should be able to listen to a passage and turn it around and, and um, ask questions themselves. So, so I'm going to turn it over to Sally okay. now to go into the example. Okay, so our first example, you're going to be listening to a shorter conversation. And while you're listening to it, we want you to think about some questions that you could ask students about. Um, so it could be true, false, yes, no, WH questions, um, prediction inference question, or rhetorical function question. And then afterwards, we have some questions for you. Um, when the audio starts playing, it may be a little bit louder than our talking, so you may have to adjust your audio settings. We also had a few issues with the audio yesterday, so I did put a transcript of the dialogue on the slide in case you can't hear it. Um, of course, in your classroom, you probably you wouldn't would provide the transcript to your students, um, but if you are having trouble with audio, just let Ben know in the moderator chat. So we're gonna listen to that audio now. Good afternoon. Can I help you find anything today? Hi, yes. I was wondering if you have this shirt in a different color. I need to buy something for my cousin, and he prefers bright colors. Yes, we have other colors on the rack in the back of the store, but they aren't on sale. Oh, I'm not worried about that. I'll go take a look. Okay, so we just listened to that. And hopefully you thought of a few questions. We didn't give you any questions beforehand, but if you're working with lower level students, sometimes it helps to give them the questions beforehand so they can really focus their listening and really try to listen for those answers. Um, but we will give you some questions now. And actually since uh, Rita, Rita's gonna be my student, I'm gonna make sure she listens to that passage. Um, so our first question is a WH question. So Rita, who is she buying a shirt for? Oh, well, I'm pretty sure it was uh, it was a relative. Um, Can you be a little more specific? Oh, yeah. Uh, it was a cousin. Good. That's right. Good. Okay. Our next question is true, false. So true or false, the shirt only comes in one color. Oh, that is false. Yeah. That is false. No. There were some other shirts. She was asking about. In the back, right? Of different right. colors. Okay. And our next question is yes, no question. Does the woman care about the price of the shirt? Absolutely not. She must be kind of wealthy because yeah. she said that doesn't matter or I'm not worried about that or, or something like that. She really likes that cousin. I personally don't have any cousins I would buy expensive <laughs> shirts for, but uh, good for her. <laughs> okay, so we're actually going to, we have an inference question and we're actually going to send that out to you in the poll. Not that we're not that we're testing you or anything. Um, we just want you to be involved. So our inference question, which you should see on the right side of your screen in the poll, is what does the man imply about the shirts in the back of the store? And then you have three or four possible options. Um, so Rita, we didn't give them the actual question that 
appeared in the MET practice book with that dialogue. Can you share that question with us? Right. So the question on that particular short dialogue is, what does the woman want to do? Okay. So what type of question would that be? What that tests skill? global listening. Global listening. It's just about the main idea. Okay. Great. So hopefully you've had a little bit of time to participate in the poll. So let's, can we end that poll and check our answers? Oh, well, wow. wow. We have a really good group. Oh you guys gosh. all paid attention. A plus for everybody. You got it right. The answer is they are more expensive. They're more expensive. And you had to know, notice, you know, it may seem like a simple question, but you had to know what on sale means and then translate, well, what's the opposite? Okay. So if they're on, if they're not on sale, that means more expensive. So. Yeah. So it's using some, some paraphrasing skills there. Right. Great. And it wasn't stated explicitly. So that's why it's called an inferential question. So moving on to strategy two. Yeah. So strategy two is when we've called listen and reply, respond, or select. Um, it's a variation on strategy one uh, that is most useful with shorter conversations or passages. It um, would probably be most commonly used um, for global listening skills, but actually there are variations. You could definitely use it for detail or um, vocabulary as well. And uh, the basic idea for this strategy is listeners are given a set of possible contexts, topics, speaker relationships, or even dialogue responses, for example, and they choose which one fits for each passage they hear. So you would have multiple passages, say three, four, or five at a time. Um, or maybe, maybe there were conversations, announcements, advertisements, um, anything short. And Using the example we just played in strategy one, shopping for a shirt, for example, we could use some similar uh, conversations like that and ask students which, give them a list of settings or locations and, and ask them to identify for each dialogue. So again, getting at global skills, which location, maybe there are some that are in a bank and a grocery store, uh, a clothing store, a school, and, and and so on. And then we have another example. Okay. So we have another example. Um, we're going to listen again to a short conversation. And while you're listening to that, we want you to think about what's the relationship of the speakers to each other. So are they teacher and student, classmates, coworkers, or family members? So let's take a listen to that audio. David, do you know when the history final is? I forget the exact date, but I think the test is sometime after our presentations. Really? I thought it was the week before. Well, I have an appointment with the professor tomorrow. I can double check with her then. ...to that conversation and Rita... Um, can you tell me what the relationship was between those two speakers? Oh, well, given this list, it has to be classmate. Okay, why do you say it has to be? What about, what about teacher and student? Well, I'll just say first family members, no, because they were talking about a final, and we just don't do finals at home. And luckily, we don't do finals at work at either. At work either, <laughs> right? I'd be in trouble. That's right. <laughs> Um, so why couldn't they be teacher and student? Well, there was a reference to, well, I'm going to ask the professor mm -hmm. or have a meeting with the professor or something. Uh, sounded like neither of them knew when the final that's was. Right. Right. So hopefully a professor would actually know. Right. So that's another thing you can do in the classroom when you do this activity is ask the students for clues that they heard um, during that conversation that gave them an indication of what the context was. Right. So they're not just trying to get the right answer, but they're really trying to hone their listening skills by saying, OK, I was listening in and this is the word I heard that helped me figure that out. Mm -hmm. Moving on to strategy three. So strategy three um, is generally used for targeting local listening skills because it focuses more on vocabulary or uh, specific details. It's often used with many lectures or other monologues, but it also can be very effectively used with dialogues. This is the strategy we call listen, 
and fill in. Um, and there are a lot of variations on this kind of strategy, but the basic strategy includes some type of scaffolded gap fill activity. For example, a chart or graphic organizer with some missing information, maybe an outline with missing details that students fill in while they're listening. A classic and simple listen and fill in activity would be what's called a closed passage based on a tried and true reading passage activity that can easily be adapted for listening to either or both dialogues and monologues. And it involves preparing a transcript ahead of time. So ideally you as the teacher would have access to the transcript, but for shorter um, passages, you know, it's not that hard to create one. Um, and you'd get a lot of mileage out of something like that. Um, and what uh, you have to do is um, blank out enough words so that students can read along while they're listening, but they have to fill in the blanks of the missing words. So for lower level learners, fewer blanks and more basic vocabulary words will make the activity more manageable. Um, for higher level learners, you can go for more words and more difficult words. Um, a few tips when doing something, uh, an activity like this, you have to listen ahead of time before you're selecting your words to make sure that um, you don't select words that are either unstressed or spoken too softly for them to be clearly heard. Uh, you can omit words on a basis of a lot of, you know, different criteria. Um, could be based on the content or vocabulary that's recently been studied, could be based on main ideas or important details of the passage. You could choose uh, randomly, like every 10th word, for example. Um, that would might make it a little more difficult. And then um, one of my favorites, you can choose part of speech. Say, you, you know, you're studying abstract nouns. You can choose nouns or in the case, in the example that you're gonna see in a minute, adjectives and adverbs, for example. You may need to pause the audio uh, depending on the level of the student, either after each blank or maybe after every couple of sentences. And um, except for advanced learners or, or students who have been doing this exercise for quite a while, uh, you are probably gonna have to repeat the whole passage at least once. And another variation uh, or another way to scaffold this activity, especially for lower level learners, would be to provide a word bank. So the, the blank, the words that are missing but um, they're all very high level learners. So we are not gonna be giving them a word bank today. Um, we're gonna be practicing this activity. So you're gonna listen to a brief lecture from a conference. And while you're listening, you're gonna see the transcript on the screen with blanks. And you're going to fill in the blanks with the missing adjectives and adverbs. So maybe um, very quick, quickly grab a pen and pencil, <laughs> write down your answers. So let's listen to the audio now. Listen to a lecture at a conference. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be at the third annual Children's Health Conference. My talk today will focus on a study my colleagues and I have done showing that children are increasing their consumption of beverages sweetened with sugar and that this has consequences for their health. The number of calories children get from sugary beverages has increased over the past two decades in the United States. We looked at both younger children and teenagers and found that they are currently getting about 20 more calories a day from these beverages than children did 20 years ago. This may not sound like much, but it's actually a substantial increase in calories. You should consider that these drinks are very low in vitamins and other nutrients. This means children are adding empty calories or calories that offer little health benefit to their diet. We found that sugar-sweetened beverages make up about 16% of the total number of calories most teenagers consume daily. To put this into perspective, a teenage boy would need to spend over three hours walking to be able to burn off these extra calories. The bottom line is, children are taking in more calories than they're burning, they're getting more than they need. 
the result is that kids are gaining weight. We feel that reducing the consumption of sugary beverages would benefit kids' health and help keep them fit. Okay, great. So we apologize to those of you who weren't able to see the audio. Ben says a few of you weren't able to hear it or see it, so we apologize. Um, but the audio is, will be um, audible on the recording. Yes. So, um, so hopefully you had a chance to listen and fill in those blanks. We're not going to test you on your answers. Um, but I did want to say, and I hope that you uh, also found this when you were trying to do it on your own, that this exercise tends to be very motivating for mm -hmm. all levels of students. There, it's kind of like a puzzle. Yeah, it's and, really fun. And really Sally fun. has a variation on this that she sometimes uses. When oh, let's talk about that. Yeah, so how do you vary this activity? Um, so one thing that I like to do, especially if this is the first or second time I'm doing it with students or it's lower level students, um, I like to give them the transcript beforehand with the blanks in it, and they read through that and they have to predict what the missing word is and then when we listen to it if they get that prediction right it, it like it is like they won right. Right. <laughs> yeah what are some other variations that you do Rita um well like I had already said earlier I I pause sometimes and uh toward the end of the semester I usually you know start weaning them off of mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. pausing and yeah. you know we'll have this little pull and push where they say <laughs> we Pause it, pause it, and I was like, no, you've been doing this long enough. And so it gives them a sense of accomplishment if in the beginning of the semester, for example, they have been able to, they needed a lot of pauses or a lot of repetition, but then by the end of the semester, they're realizing that, you know, they can get almost all the words without any pauses. It's 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 a good way to sort of um, illustrate their own progress for them. Yeah, and then I, I mean, I know your opinion about word banks, but would you provide a word bank? We didn't provide a word bank to you guys. Um, n no, I generally don't, but um, my experience has been more with advanced learners. Mm -hmm. So I think that for younger learn, for for um, lower level learners, mm -hmm. I would absolutely consider that, especially if there are a few extra words so that yeah. it's not completely just a matching exercise. Yeah, adding some extra words. Another thing that I thought would be fun, especially with this activity, since it was all adjectives and adverbs, um, would be providing the opposite words. So, for example, um, there was little, you could have big, empty, full. So that's kind of working their vocabulary skills Along as well as their listening, listening skills. Right. Yeah. Um, what about how many times do you think you would play this for your students? Probably twice. Probably twice. Mm -hmm. But, you know, again, depending on, but something this long. Um, it's not super long, but it's long enough that I would want them to have a second chance. For yeah. Sure. And then you said, as it goes, you know, playing it less, right, and getting that sense of accomplishment. Yeah. Okay. Moving on to strategy four. All right. So um, now we're moving into the um, the strategies that we are um, that 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 lend themselves more to the advanced learners. Um, the first one, strategy four, is called listen and write, and um, Unlike the previous strategy, the close uh, activity, which involves transcribing exactly what they hear, single words or phrases sometimes, this task involves students composing or generating a brief written response of some sort to a listening passage. So the written response could include, for example, writing a title that fits the passage, writing a single sentence summary of the conversation or monologue, taking notes, uh, or writing an outline, um, or a longer piece of writing, like a response paragraph or a reaction or opinion, um, which could actually be relatively short as well, but is a little different than a summary because they're in, inserting their own thoughts or reactions to it. Mm -hmm. And um, something like a text or an email, which is a very authentic activity, because yeah. how many times do you hear something and then you have to relay that to somebody via text. Yeah, like maybe your friend missed the lecture and you have to tell them what happened. Right. And a fun way to do that too might be to use, you know, text language, although I don't know if I would understand it <laughs> when they did it. Okay, so we're gonna... Our... So, as, um, so, so the single sentence summary could be used for either a monologue or a mini lecture. Um, and most 
Advanced learners should be able to generate their own summary sentences, but lower level learners may need a sentence stem or may need a, a set of possible choices that they could use. Um, and, and I would say also that most of the listen and write activities would focus more on global skills, um, but you could absolutely include, you know, say filling in an outline um, or, or writing an outline that includes some detail. Uh, so again, this is very adaptable. Um, and Sally's gonna okay. go through an example again. Okay, so we're gonna think about that monologue that you just heard for strategy three, hopefully you heard it. Um, and using the poll function, we want you to choose an appropriate title. Um, so we have four different titles. We have sugary drinks in your children, a perfect pair, the effects of sugary beverages on children's health, a history of soda in America, and sweet drinks increase children's calorie consumption by 50%. Um, so Rita, if you were doing this activity in your classroom and the students had to create a title um, for that lecture, what are some words that maybe they might pick out to use for that? Well, um, so sugar or sugary or maybe a synonym of mm -hmm. that, something like sweet yeah. would I like, be important. Yeah. I like this activity a lot because it does help them practice those paraphrasing, paraphrasing. skills. Yeah, so you can see from the list, we don't just have sugary beverages. We have drinks, we have sweet soda. Okay, so let's take a look at our poll results. So we're ending that poll. So again, this group is really listening. Okay. Yep. Um, we have 86% chose the second one, and that is the correct answer. The one I would choose. A couple of people chose the last one. This one is kind of a trick because we actually put it in the wrong percentage. No, it there. wasn't quite as high as 50%. Yeah. <laughs> yes. If you miss that detail, no worries. Okay. All right, so um, moving on to strategy five. Uh, this is a strategy that involves mainly um, speaking with listening, and both, both strategy, strategy five and strategy six are mainly pairing listening with speaking practice. Um, which is, of course, a natural combination for language learning. And listen and retell is what we call strategy five. It's it's uh, an activity that can be used with either dialogues or mini lectures, lectures, any kind of monologue as well. The essence of the strategy is to create a context for learners to report back to someone orally about what they heard. So listen and retell could target global skills, or main ideas, but it could also require including some specific details in the retelling. The emphasis here is on getting the facts or the information right, not on memorizing or reciting the words that they mm -hmm. heard. So it's really a retelling as we often, again, do in, in real life. Um, you know, how, how often do you hear something, maybe it's a conversation at work and yeah. you're telling somebody else, who doesn't work with you, what you heard, or you heard something on the news and you're retelling the gist of it. You're not gonna pretend to be the newscaster. You're gonna <laughs> tell someone, not. hey, I heard this interesting <laughs> news story about children and beverages and I'm thinking maybe we shouldn't have any more sodas in our house. <laughs> so, um, so thinking back uh, um, to that, to the, the to the monologue we heard about mm -hmm. sugary beverages, um, I guess just think for yourself um, how might your students recap those main ideas yeah. to a partner. Okay, and we're actually going to listen to another slightly longer conversation. And in this conversation, you're going to hear somebody looking at an apartment. And you're going to imagine that you are the speaker who's looking for that apartment and your speaking partner is your future roommate who unfortunately could not come with you to check out the apartment. And you're afterwards going to tell them about that apartment you saw. So let's take a listen. Hi, I'm Steve Walters. I called earlier about seeing the apartment. Oh, hi, Steve. I'm Nancy. Come on in. Uh, sorry for the mess. I'm in the middle of packing everything up, as you can probably tell by all the boxes. Oh, no problem. Wow, this place is a lot bigger than I imagined. 
Most of the apartments I've looked at in this neighborhood are really small. Yes, this is unusually large for the area. And this is a great location, near the subway, the grocery store. Wow, and look at all the light you get in here. Those big windows. The last place I looked at today was like a cave. Really small, tiny windows, no light. Um, so how much is the rent again? It's $800 a month, but that includes gas, electricity, and trash collection. But you will have to pay for water. But that never cost me more than another $20 a month. That's a very good deal. Um, and uh, when would the apartment be available? On the 1st. As you can see, I'm still in the process of packing, but I'll have all my stuff moved out of here on the 28th or 29th. I hired a professional cleaning service to come in and scrub everything and shampoo the carpets and all that kind of stuff. It'll be like new when they're done and ready for a new tenant to move in on the 1st. Well, uh, come on. I'll give you a tour of the rest of the place. Okay. Um, so you just listened to that conversation. So Rita, you were just checking out that apartment. Let's imagine you're a student in this scenario and I'm your future roommate. Um, so what are some things that you might tell me about that apartment. Sally, I just, ha I, I went to see this great apartment this afternoon. I wish you could have come with me. It was really awesome. I think yeah. it's the place for us. Yep, I think I think that's where we should, I we think we should rent it. It's, it's big, it has a lot of light, okay. which I love, you know, I can't stand dark basement apartments. Um, and the, outgoing uh, renter was really friendly and, mm -hmm. and she said she was going to clean it. I, um, I'm a student. I don't have oh, a lot the, of money. How much is it going to cost? Well, let me tell you, the budget, was, the, the price, the rent was really, really reasonable. I, I think it was like $800. Okay. That includes most of the utilities too. And the location, right in the middle of everything we need. Awesome. So, Okay, so that might be what uh, retelling might look like between your students. Um, and it's good to have half of them listening to one right. dialogue and the other half li listening to another dialogue, whether that means having some leave the room or if you have devices that they can listen to separately so they don't know the information. So they're really trying to find out what their partner has to tell them and they're also reacting to what their partner Right, and and actually, I would add this activity could be used um, with sort of a, an at-home portion where you assign them to listen to something short um, or however long you want, and and they do that on their own time, and then they have to remember something to tell yeah. a partner to. So there are a lot of again, just a lot of variations on that, and also very authentic, right? Like you, how many times you go watch a movie and then tell people tell about it later? About it. Right, yeah. right. So we're at the last strategy now, um, which is a variation. It's an expansion, really, of strategy five. It's called listen and reenact or expand. Um, it's primarily, though, unlike the uh, strategy five, which could be used for a monologue or a dialogue, this one could be used, um, is primarily used with a conversational passage. It allows students to expand on what they've listened to. And the task, the, the task for students is to role play or recreate the dialogue with a partner. So in this case, they're not retelling the information, but they're reenacting it. Um, and it could be, uh, the task could be to reenact the dialogue with as many of the same details as possible as they can remember. Or for more advanced learners, what we like, you know, the, the, um, Creative, the, the more creative variation on this would be to give your students a few parameters where they change some of the details and they recreate a similar dialogue that's, that they deliberately add, it, add different things or change it up. So for the expansion activity, they might, um, well, they would, for, for either of these, they would have to have heard the dialogue multiple times. They would have to be very familiar with the content. Um, and it, this kind of activity could actually be a good follow-up activity to almost any of the previous strategies using the same dialogue. 
Um, it would work well for short conversations as well as longer ones. And one of the really nice things about this is even though it might seem like it's primarily a speaking activity following mm -hmm. on from a listening activity, it really is about the students listening to each other. And so it engages them in interactive peer listening. Because it's not scripted, right? It's right. They really have to listen and be able to respond. Right. The, the, you would want to discourage them from anything more than brief notes, you know, as they prepare. You wouldn't want them to script it because then it becomes a writing and reading activity mm -hmm. and not a speaking and listening activity. So, okay. Sally. So if we were thinking about that last um, conversation that we heard about the apartment hunting dialogue, and we were asking our students to create a similar dialogue where one person is looking at an apartment, um, but they had to change some of aspects of that conversation. So first, maybe we'll ask them to change some details about the apartment or the location. So what would be some details they could change? Oh, they might say, well, the location is out in the country. It's not in the middle oh, yeah. of town or the location is in a bad part of town or, you know, the um, the location is right next to a neighbor that they know. Uh -huh. um, they could change the way it looks big it is whether it's yeah that bright. that apartment had a lot of light so, so they could look at one in the basement it's dark <laughs> um you could also change the participants or speakers so in that conversation it was a future tenant looking at a current tenant's apartment so what are some different speakers that could be in that conversation well it could be the landlord showing the apartment mm -hmm. as opposed to the person who's living there um yeah it could be the roommates going together. Yeah, two roommates. Right. That and way, you know, you can have a three-person conversation. Three-person conversation. Maybe the two roommates or the two people going don't have the same opinion about it. Yeah. You know, maybe you know. they have very different things that they're looking for. <laughs> right. Um, and then the last one, my personal favorite, you could change the emotion, opinion, or effect. So, for example, what are some different emotions that people in that conversation could have? Like in that conversation that we listened to. They were both so happy and so nice, but how else could that have gone down? Yeah, well, the person moving out could have been completely rude and yes, not yes. very interested in, you know, maybe they were upset they had to move or mm -hmm. maybe, you know, they were in a rush and they weren't going to clean the place. So there could yeah. be kind of some negative. Yeah, the future roommate loved, I mean, the future tenant really loved it. Maybe he hates it. Right. Who knows? So yeah, it's some different variation. And what I like about that last one too is that students really have to listen and respond, but also they get to pay attention to those nonverbal cues too mm -hmm. that are really so important in listening. And the key for the for the teachers for for setting this activity up for the students is to give them the the categories of things that you want them to keep the same and the ones that that they can change. So you know, you could say just do any dialogue about apartment hunting and let them you know go free range, or you could um, tell them exactly what you want them to change. Mm -hmm. So we're going to open up the Q&A in a second, but first, let's do a little summary. So yeah, we um, this is it for our six strategies. Um, that Just a little uh, glimpse of some of the activities with each strategy. Uh, we hope that what we've presented here has given you some new ideas for classroom activities you can use with your students for listening. We tried to show you how each strategy relates to the global, local, or inferential listening skills of the MET, and how each of the strategies can be adapted for lower or higher level learners, and that you know the ways that the strategies integrate speaking, writing, or uh, reading into the listening activities in different ways, and that you know they can be used with different kinds of um, listening input. So we're just about ready for our Q&A. Yeah. We hope you'll stick around for that. But um, be, but just to uh, close this out, before the Q&A, I wanted to mention that we do have another, this will be an ongoing series of webinars. We um, The next one next month will be um, a similar topic, but focused on uh, the MET Go, our test for uh, adolescent language learners. And then later in the fall, we'll be doing a series for both MET and MET Go on speaking skills. Um, the Again, the practice test book is available. The classroom and, and um, teacher edition are available from the U of M Press. 
and watch your email for our certificate of attendance and the detailed handout. And thank you again, everyone, for participating yeah. today. Yeah. Um, so we're going to start the Q&A session. So um, if you can go to the right part of your screen and click on the Q&A, and then you can enter any question or comment that you might have. Um, and then if you see questions or comments that you'd like us to address, you can also like them. Um, so we know that you want us to talk about that. So let's see. I'm going to make sure I can see all of our questions. It looks like we have three questions so far. Is that correct, Ben? Or am I not seeing? Okay. Um, new questions. Let's see. Can we go all the way So along? our first question. Oh, it's done. Are you sending some material about this to the email? Yes. Yes. So we'll have the PowerPoint slides will be available and a, a summary handout with some added suggested suggested activities that we didn't have time to go into. Mm -hmm. And those will all be coming um, early next week, I think Monday. Yeah, let's hope so. Um, also, on our website, we do have some practice tests we and do. other materials. Mm -hmm. So if you can't wait until then, um, please check out our website. Um, so we have from Claudio, thanks for the webinar. Should I want to train students to... For taking the MET exam, what material would you recommend apart from the book you are showing? Um, well, like I said, we do have materials on our website. There's a sample test, um, and there is uh, there are samples of writing activities and other activities that will be developed over the coming months um, that will be downloadable from the website. Also, um, of course, any textbook series that is uh, geared towards the, mm -hmm. the levels of A2 to C1 would be, you know, totally suitable for practicing, for, for preparing your students for yeah. the portions of the MET. Yeah, I mean, keep in mind that the MET is made to be an authentic test with authentic listening experiences like dialogues and monologues, things that they might hear you know, every day. So there's, a, you don't have to just use yeah. test practice materials, right. but you could be using podcasts, um, textbook materials, even just have them listen to conversations with native speakers and well, might be eavesdropping, but, <laughs> but keep in mind that you don't just have to use, you know, test prep materials to prepare them. There are um, questions. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Let's just see that we're not seeing all the questions. Yeah, this the display of the um, question is a little hard. Is there That's... any way to band it? Oh, okay. Here we see a question from Galia. Reading is one of the great problems in my country, and I think in other countries as well. What do you do to get the attention from the students? So, so how, since... to, how to get them reading more? I mean, I think the most important thing is that they have to be reading things that they're they're interested at their in level and, yeah, yeah at their level and that they're interested in um hopefully one of our webinars in the upcoming series will also be addressing right. reading strategies that would be right? the third in the series <laughs> oh, yes, third writing or series. reading will be coming after um listening and speaking yeah so um, we 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 actually got some feedback from people um as to what would be the most pressing um, topics. And so we went in an order that was, we, you know, according to the people who gave us feedback. So, yeah, everyone has slight, slightly different um, points, place, places where they really need, their students particularly need extra support. Mm -hmm. um, here we do have a question about the listening part. What kind of exercises would you suggest to improve this skill? So we talked a little bit about that, but I am always advocating for podcasts. That was my favorite way to have my students practice their listening, especially outside of the classroom. I usually had them download a podcast app. One of my favorites was Stitcher. Um, if you just search in the app for ESL podcasts, it will. there's a whole long list of them. Um, some of my favorites were All Ears English and ESL Pod and ESL Cafe. Usually I would assign them one podcast to listen to each week, they would get to pick an episode and then um, come in and tell the class about it. What are some other things that you did with listening to get them practicing that? So, um, 
listening, I mean, all of the activities that we talked about in our in our framework are activities that should be, you know, I think it's important to vary what you do. You can't just tell students, go and listen to the radio or TV mm -hmm. and, and that'll improve your listening. Although, of course, it will the more they listen. Um, but doing certain targeted activities, listening and write, write something about the main idea, listen and, you know, answer questions, listen and fill in uh, details or those kinds of things. Um, listen and have a, a follow on conversation of some sort. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So um, students' responses in the, in the listening be guided to perfect spelling or more to what is said and then corrected. Okay. So um, that's a, really that's a good, question. good question because, um, so one of the things I, I meant to say and left out was, in, for example, in the close activity where you're filling in what the words you hear, I always tell my students not to worry about spelling when they're mm -hmm. doing that kind of a, um, that kind of a listening activity because the focus is on, did they get the words? Did they get the meaning? Mm -hmm. And if they're focused on the spelling, which, which a lot of students do, when they're writing something. And the point really is, as long as they can recognize, and if, if it's for a grade or, you know, I'm marking it, if somebody, you know, if, if uh -huh. I can recognize the word, then they got it right, then it's not, because you have to, you have to separate out, this isn't a writing activity. Yeah. It's not for developing your writing skills, it's for developing your listening skills. Mm -hmm. So yes, the answer would be more to what is said and then later corrected. Yeah. Okay. Um... We have a question from Bogota. There's not much of a variety of practice materials for preparing students to take the test. Who could I get a hold of um, to provide the material? Where could I buy some? So the book that we're talking about is available for shipment anywhere. So U of M Press will ship anywhere in the world. Um, and so as far as a practice test book, there will also be um, in the next couple of, in, Soon, very soon, there will be some local distributors in uh, South America of these books. Um, so listen or, you know, check our website, check mm -hmm. our Facebook for announcements about when those local district, you know, if you don't want to order and pay for the shipping to get to get the books. Also, um yeah, I mean, I'm not sure if it's mostly, if the question is mostly about press practice test books or if the question is also about resources. But mm -hmm. we do have some suggestions for listening, specific to listening, for some freely available resources that are online uh, for source material yeah. for listening. And we will include that in the handout. That, that will be listed on the handout when you get that. Um, this is a good question. Are all the audios in American English or do they include other accents? So all of our tests at Machine Language Assessment focus on American English. Um, so it uh, is all spoken with a standard American accent. Um, but there's definitely other materials right. out there that do allow them to practice listening to other accents as well. Right. And and if you have students who really want to listen to more than one accent, there one yeah, there are podcasts and you can look up ESL learning podcasts and you can find American English versions or British English versions of different podcasts. There's a website called um, Breaking News English which is uh a well has a wealth of material as one example, and they include um, news, modern, contemporary news stories, very, very current, at different rates of speech. So slowed down, and then more of a medium speed, and then something that would be more, more natural. And there, most of those stories are produced in both an American version and, an, and a British English version. So you know there are resources that are available mm -hmm. out there for students who really want to. Expo you, if you want to expose your students to more um, accents. But of course, yes, the, the Michigan language assessment focus is on North American English. Yeah. Um, we have a good question from Mateo. Um, the format and structure of the listening section in the MYLE and MET Go are the same as the one presented for the MET? Um, that's a great question. They are built so that they there is, you know, some similarities there, but the questions are very different 
the question types are very different between MYLE and METGO, mostly because they are for younger learners. So we, we try to do things, you know, adding pictures, making them more graphic, um, and definitely using topics that would be familiar to those young learners. And we will have a webinar on right. listening month. for METGO coming up. I don't, is there any webinars planned for MYLE? So for MYLE, we plan to offer a webinar that sort of some tips for working with younger learners mm -hmm. across all the skills. Um, and that would be later in the fall or early winter. But yeah, the METGO listening webinar will be early September. Yeah. So watch for, um, watch for an announcement about the dates of that. I think we have the dates already, but yeah. they're not on the top of my. And as always, mind. you can always check out our website too, for examples. Or email, yes. Yeah. Any other um, last minute questions like one more before? Minute. How long do you think an MET preparation could last? Hmm. I think, it, I, I don't, I don't <laughs> so, I my, so my sense, um, here's, I, it very much depends on your school and your resources. When I think about this book, this book has four practice tests. And uh, the suggestion in the beginning of the book is for, you know, a, a minimum of a semester, a semester long course where you would um, be studying all of your skills, you're listening, reading, writing, and speaking. And the practice test would just be one component of that. And you might, you know, in the beginning of the semester, take one of the, give the students one of the practice tests and then see where they need to improve. And then uh, a few months later, give them a second one. And then as it gets close to the end of the semester, no, but that assumes that, that you would give them the last two practice tests shortly before they're gonna take the exam. That assumes that they're already at a, a, a level that's nearly, you know, at least at an A2 and they're really working on improving from an A2 up. Because of course the MET is not a pass or fail test. Mm -hmm. It's a multi-level test. If the students are only at A2, they're gonna get a certificate that says they're at A2. Their results will show that. If they're um, higher, B1 or B2, you know, it's gonna show that as well. So so there's really no set time. Okay, so we have to wrap up. Um, we weren't able to get to all the questions, um, but we do have our email address up here. Oh, it has an extra E. Sorry oh. about that. <laughs> so um, that email will send you directly to Ben. So if you do have questions for us, please feel free to send us an email and we'll be addressing those. Info at michiganassessment.org. Okay, and right. thank you so much for joining us. Yes, thank you again, everyone.